Hello, and welcome to our first episode of Myths and Misadventures from the National Hellenic Museum. My name is Cairo, and I will be your storyteller. In this series, I'll be sharing a couple of myths about gods, heroes, and monsters each episode, and they will be accompanied by an activity for you to do at home. Today, I'll be telling you the ancient stories of how the gods came to live on Olympus with Zeus as their king, of Persephone and how the seasons came to be, and about mighty Athena and how Athens got its name. The version of these stories that I will be reading today come from a very particular book. It comes from a book called Mortals and Immortals of Greek Mythology by Francois Rachmiel and Charlotte Gastrot. You should be able to find this book anywhere you find books, Amazon, etc. We encourage you to check out local bookstores, though, if you're interested. And without further ado, let's get mythical. Our first tale of today tells the story of how Zeus became king of the gods and how the gods themselves came to live on Olympus. But first, our story begins with the gods' predecessors, the Titans. Here's the tale of Zeus. Kronos, the Titan, was worried. While his wife Bria was pregnant with their first child, it was foretold that one of his own sons would dethrone him one day. Kronos was big and tall, with a strong appetite and a large stomach. When the child was born, he made his decision. Under the pretext of admiring him more closely, he brought the child to his face, and then opened his mouth and swallowed him. He did the same with the four following children. Rhea was in despair. When she was pregnant again, she confided in her mother, Gaia, who consoled her and gave her some advice. When it was time for her to give birth, Rhea snuck out of her palace and went to Crete. She climbed a mountain, found a cave, and made herself at home. There, she gave birth to a large boy, who she named Zeus. She swaddled him in the golden cradle that she had made sure to bring with her. But she couldn't stay long. She had to make sure Kronos didn't notice her absence. Who would be able to take care of the baby? Who would feed him? That was when she noticed two young girls in the cave. They were two nymphs, graceful divinities in charge of watching over the waters, mountains, and forests. In front of them stood a large goat with long hair and golden horns. She approached the goat's udder, and Zeus began to suck. This is Almathia, the goat, said the nymphs. She will give her milk to your child. When he is a little older, he'll also be able to eat honey. There are plenty of bees on top of the mountain. Thank you. However, what will happen if he makes any noise? Babies babble, cry, and laugh. His father might hear. Kronos has great hearing. Then we will call the Corabantes, the young warriors in charge of defending the country. When they hit their shields and swords together while stomping their feet and singing hymns, they will drown out any sound. Rhea thanked the nymphs, and then bent over to kiss her son one last time. Zeus was already asleep. He looked happy, smiling with a drop of milk at the corner of his upturned mouth. The tightness left, reassured, but still she had more to do. When she returned to the palace, she slipped into her chambers and began to moan, as if she were giving birth. Finally, she called her husband. Where is he? Where's the newborn? he asked. Give him to me. Rhea handed him a large rock wrapped in a blanket, and without delay, Kronos swallowed it. The rock passed easily from his throat to his stomach. Years passed, and Zeus grew up. He left the cave and was now living in the mountain among the shepherds. He partook in their games and festivals and, like them, took care of the goats. Sometimes he would descend the mountain to the edge of the water, he knew that beyond the water, further on land, was his father's palace. One night, he was walking along the beach when he noticed a beautiful young woman smiling at him as she stepped out from the waves. He rubbed his eyes, and in the next moment, he could no longer see her. Instead, all he saw was a white seagull floating above the waves. Was he dreaming? And now, instead of the bird, a prancing dolphin. But he barely had time to reach out to pet the dolphin when a mocking laugh sounded out and the young woman reappeared. Who are you? asked Zeus. Are you a magician? I am an oceanid, and I like to transform. My name is Metis, which means both wisdom and cunning. I know who you are and that you wish to free your siblings trapped in Kronos's stomach. Find your mother and ask her to find a potion that will make someone throw up. You will present yourself to him as a cupbearer. Serve him a drink, and you'll put the honey potion in the brew that you'll offer your father. Then you will see what will happen. Go! 
Following Metis' advice, Zeus introduced himself as a cupbearer, ever the glutton. Kronos ate and drank an enormous amount over the course of the meal and soon took to vomiting. He first vomited the large rock that he had swallowed in place of Zeus. And then, one after the other, his five first children in the inverse order of their birth. Poseidon, Hades, Hera, Demeter, and Hestia. The two gods and the three goddesses took a stand behind Zeus. You are still young, they told him, but you proved your intelligence and courage. Be our leader. Zeus accepted and led his brothers and sisters to the top of Olympus, the tall mountain crowned with snow and bathed in light. It became the residence of the gods, and they became known as the Olympians. But the Titans were furious. They weren't going to allow themselves to be dethroned by some young upstarts. Cronus was getting old, so he named Atlas to lead them. The Titans saw Olympians broke out into a great and uncertain the excuse me. The Titans and Olympians broke out into a great uncertain war that lasted ten years. The universe tore and returned to chaos, and the very state that had reigned at the beginning of all things. So Gaia saw fit to call Zeus, her grandson. Your strengths are evenly matched, she told him. You will only win over the Titans if you get help from those that share their savage strength. The hundred-handed ones and the Cyclops. The monsters that reside in Tartarus. Free them and bring them to your side. Zeus descended to the bottom of the world below to meet with the monsters. You will be allowed to eat our food, share our nectar and ambrosia, and you will become a mortal like us, he promised them. The hundred-handed ones and the Cyclops followed Zeus and lent him their strength. The Cyclops even gifted him his greatest weapon, lightning. While the hundred-handed ones threw enormous rocks, Zeus, from the top of Olympus, hurled his lightning at the Titans. Overpowered and soon defeated, the Titans were imprisoned in Tartarus. As for Atlas, he was condemned to hold up the sky upon his shoulders. The Olympians rewarded Zeus, who led them to victory with power. He became the king of the gods and the master of the world, who would reign over justice and order. He divided the universe into three kingdoms that he shared with his two brothers after they pulled lots. Zeus received the sky, Poseidon the oceans, and Hades the underworld. The earth itself belonged to the three of them together. To ensure his reign would last and be peaceful, Zeus decided to marry. His first wife was Metis, and his second was his sister, Hera. But Zeus had an innumerable adventures and many children. Gods when their gods when their mothers were a goddess, and demigods when she was but a mortal. And many of these gods found their place among the Olympians. And that is the tale of how Zeus became the king of the gods, and the gods came to overthrow the Titans and live upon Mount. Our next story today begins with Demeter, the goddess of the harvest and one of the Olympians and it will tell of how the seasons came to be. Let's begin. Demeter lived in Sicily, a rich, bountiful land for wheat to grow. There, she raised her cherished daughter, Persephone, far from the Olympians whom she did not trust. And then came Hades, with the sudden desire to get married. He said he needed a woman by his side to rule the underworld. He thought of his beautiful niece, Persephone. She was young, sure, but what did it matter? Hades made his way to Olympus to get Zeus' approval. His brother gave it, but neither of the two thought to tell Demeter. One beautiful spring morning in a small valley, Persephone was picking Narcissus, this kind of flower, with her friends. They were competing to pick the biggest bouquet of flowers, so that she had walked away from her friends, hoping to find more flowers on her own. Suddenly, a black chariot pulled by black horses appeared in front of her. Hades, who was driving the chariot, leaned forward and grabbed her. Persephone fought and cried, but the god of the underworld held on to her tightly. He pulled her along as the ground opened and the chariot made its way down to the underworld. Everything happened so fast that nobody realized what had occurred. When Demeter learned that her daughter disappeared, her heart was filled with worry and she set out, determined to find her. She covered Sicily, Greece, and even Asia. She looked for nine months, riding her dragon-pulled chariot, a torch lit with Mount Etna's flame in hand. In all this time, she didn't drink, she didn't eat, she didn't sleep. 
One night, Zeus, moved by a Demeter's anguish, forced her to swallow a drink made of poppy to make her fall asleep and allow her a reprieve from her sadness, even if only for a few hours. Continuing her quest, Demeter at last arrived in Eleusis, in the south of Greece. She was received by its king and queen. When their eldest son returned from the fields, she questioned him. I may be able to give you a piece of useful information, he told her. My brother was feeding his pigs when he saw the ground open up in front of him and swallow one of his herd. It was then that he saw a chariot speeding along. It was pulled by black horses and made their way deep underground. He didn't have time to see the driver's face, but he did see that he was holding a woman in his arms, and he heard her scream. Thank you, young man. The old goddess of the moon, Hecate, should be able to tell me more, since she sees everything, when all else sleeps. Hecate had heard the screams, but she didn't know anything else. Go to the sun, she said. He who brightens the world all day and knows all that transpires. The sun thought for a moment before he realized he had, in fact, seen Hades take Persephone. In my opinion, he added, without a hint of malice, Zeus must have known. When Demeter heard his words, she grew furious. Ah, so I have Zeus to blame for this. He must have taken great pleasure in my sorrow. If he thinks I am going to throw myself at his feet, he is sorely mistaken. I won't give him the pleasure. Demeter locked herself in her palace and remained there, neither speaking nor moving. She stopped providing her blessings upon the world, and as a result, the harvests died. Seeds dried out, plants withered, and fruits spoiled. Crops died, and there was nothing left to harvest. Men and animals alike were going to die of hunger, and still Demeter would not leave. From the top of Olympus, Zeus was growing worried. He tried to reason with his sister. Her daughter was happily married, and Hades was not a scornful type. He was the sovereign of the underworld, and Persephone shared his throne. But Demeter wouldn't hear any of it, and the world, once lush and bountiful, continued to turn barren. So Zeus sent a messenger to Hades to let him know what was happening. He asked him to return Persephone to her mother. Hades accepted. He had realized that his young wife wasn't suited to the perpetual darkness of the underworld, and that she missed the light of day. But in order for her to return to the world of the living, she could not have tasted of the food of the dead. Otherwise, she would not be allowed to leave the underworld. That was the law. But Persephone ignored that law. Not only did she eat pomegranate seeds, but she was seen eating them. When Demeter learned of this, she fell into despair once more. Fortunately, Zeus found a compromise that Hades and Demeter both accepted. Persephone would spend six months of the year with her husband in the underworld, and she would spend the other six months with her mother, becoming the symbol for plants and crops which would sleep in the winter before being reborn again in springtime, in the light of the sun. And that is the tale of Persephone and how we came to have seasons. Our final tale today concerns Athena, the goddess of honor, war, and wisdom, and how Athens came to have its name. So we begin. Zeus's first marriage was with Metis, the Oceanid he had met in Crete. Soon, she was pregnant with the child. Zeus was worried. What would happen if she gave birth to a boy as clever and cunning as she was? When he grew up, he would surely try to dethrone his father, like Zeus had dethroned Kronos, and like how previously Kronos had dealt with Uranus. The king of the gods had no intention of ceding his place to anyone. He had, he had to stop Metis from giving birth to this child, and so he needed to be more cunning than she was. Since Metis was a shapeshifter, Zeus asked her to change forms, and so she shifted into a roaring lion. But would she be able to transform into a simple insect? Without suspicion, Metis transformed into a fly, and Zeus swallowed her. Soon after, he was overcome with a terrible headache. In his despair, Zeus called for Hephaestus, Zeus called, excuse me, Zeus called for Hephaestus, god of the forge, and asked him for help. With one strike of his hammer, he split Zeus's head in two. With a victory cry, Athena emerged from Zeus's head, fully formed, wearing a helmet, armor, and wielding a spear and a shield. The goddess wielded her weapons in times of war. The leaders of the armies would consult with her, since she was a master of strategies and tactics. 
Unlike her brother Ares, she held disdain for unnecessary violence and battles without honor. In times of peace, she would lay down her arms and wear a simple tunic instead. She taught man how to tame a horse, drive a chariot, and sail a boat. She taught women how to spin and weave wool, and it was from her that the city of Athens got its name. Cecrops, the king of Athens, had built a town on a hill in the south of Greece. To choose its name, he called on the gods that lived in the region, Athena and Poseidon. The gods were jealous of each other and were unable to come to an agreement, so Cecrops came to a decision. He would name the town after the god who offered the most useful gift to his people. The other Olympians would be the judges. They met on the city's battlements. It was a hot day, and the plains extended ahead of them, flooded by sunlight, without the least bit of shade. Poseidon made his way first, full of confidence, and slammed the ground with his trident. A horse emerged from the splintered ground. What a magnificent beast, exclaimed the gods. We could hitch him to a chariot when we go to war. Then, Athena touched her spear to the ground, where an olive tree full of olives adorned with silver leaves, grew over the plains and provided gentle shade. How pleasant, said the goddesses, the trees will shade us, and we could use the fruits. The tree represents peace. Cecrops, who preferred peace to war, agreed with their opinion, and so Athena won, and the city became Athens. Now that you've heard these tales, it's time for the activity. This week's challenge is an at-home scavenger hunt. The first person to find and photograph all of the scavenger hunt items and submit them will win a free year-long family membership to the National Hellenic Museum. Detailed instructions about the scavenger hunt can be found in the description of this video. The scavenger hunt also includes some shortened written versions of the myths that you heard today that were written by NHM's own Katie Kaleidis. You may notice that there are some differences between the versions of the stories that you heard from me today and the ones accompanying the scavenger hunt, but I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Part of the magic of mythology is that there is no one version of this story or any of these stories and that different storytellers have their own particular interpretations preferences and opinions about these tales and the people in them and each version provides some new perspectives and interpretation and i think that's part of what makes mythology really exciting as you read katie's version think about some of the changes that she made and how they affect the story or if you've heard other tellings that do it a little differently in other places in your life there's always so much more that you can discover. Happy hunting.